Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to new day and uh, new sessions. This morning, let's begin this time with a word of prayer. Uh, could one of us please lead us in prayer? Amen. Go ahead. Father, we want to say thank you. The King of Glory, we want to say thank you. The ancient of this, we want to say thank you. For the breath we breathe this morning, for you seeing us through this morning, we say thank you. That it would commit our lecturer and the lecture into your hands this morning. Father, enlighten our understanding in the name of Jesus. And at the end of this course, my Father, my God, I pray that we would become a practical of your word in the name of Jesus. Thank you, my Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, success. All right. So uh, before we go in uh, to today's sessions, last week we uh, ended in chapter eight. <clears throat> we looked at uh, the new covenant and the old covenant contrast and how, uh, uh, you know, the contrast between what, what happened in the old covenant and what Jesus did in the new covenant and uh, uh, how the old covenant is more of the law and the new covenant is of grace and old covenant you know just was uh, uh, brought condemnation the new covenant is full of grace and truth now uh, now we've established the fact that you and i as believers are part of this new covenant we also established the fact that the new covenant is a greater covenant with greater promises and greater glory and greater uh, uh, you know uh, greater work and manifestations uh, of the holy spirit in the new covenant now in the old covenant we see that the people were their daily life was affected uh, with the old covenant meaning uh, so if you look at in the old covenant everything that they did was in line with the covenant right uh, so if you look at uh, uh, you know all the uh, all the offerings the sacrifices the feasts uh, you know the the tabernacle the or temple everything affected their daily lives right it was not like what we see now right uh, okay wake up go on a sunday go to church come no uh, it was a it was something that was always constantly in their mind in the old covenant always okay uh, these are things that i have to do these are the uh, feasts these are the uh, you know offerings these are the sacrifices that i have to do so everything in their daily life pointed to the uh, to the law to the covenant now we go to chapter 9 how is it as you and i as believers how is the new covenant affecting our daily life or the question we can ask ourselves is, does it affect our lives or is everything still the same? Let's look at chapter 9. Uh, chapter 9 on page, just tell you. Yeah, page 39 uh, on your notes. Uh, chapter 9, page 39, the new covenant in daily living. Right Now, we need to learn to let the new covenant, the blood that God, our Lord Jesus, shed on the cross, the, the covenant of the cross, what Jesus did in the new covenant, we must let this covenant affect our daily life. right? So what does the Bible teach us about this new covenant? Just a few points. First one, the Bible teaches us that we are his own special people, right? Now, when you look at the old covenant as well, uh, uh, God had his own special people. That was the Jews, right? Uh, but now in the new covenant, all of us, whether we are Jew, Gentile, it does not matter. Paul writes and he says, Jew or Gentile, it doesn't matter. We are his own special people. Let's read Titus Two and verse 14. Uh, I just want to request maybe a few of us to quickly uh, begin to read. There'll be a couple of verses that we'll go through in this in these two classes. So uh, yeah, two, three of us. Titus chapter 2, verse 3 to 15. Go ahead. Sorry, ch ch Titus 2, verse 14. Yeah. 
Titus 2 verses 14 who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. Amen. Thank you, Sid. Now, it says here, some of the versions on the notes, it says, his own special people. He gave himself up to redeem us from the law and he made us his own special people. Right? Right? So when we look at ourselves as people in the new covenant, we must understand that we are his own special people. Now, does that mean that God is showing favoritism? God has a special liking to us than to the others? Not really. We know that John 3.16 says God so loved the world. He loves the world equally. Uh, but again, you know, when we, when we read the book of Ephesians, we will understand that when we are in him, uh, we are predestined in Christ. There are blessings and, and, and there's this uh, special place, the special relationship that the Lord uh, you know, establishes with us. right? And what is the special uh, people? Why are we special people? For good works, to bless, to be uh, 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 you know, fruitful for the kingdom of God. First Peter chapter 2 and verse 9, uh, Peter writes it so beautifully. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Right? Paul is right. Sorry, Peter is writing. Now he's writing mostly uh, to Gentile believers. Right, First Peter, uh, he's writing mostly the letters addressed mostly to the Roman believers. And he's saying, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Uh, and so as believers, you and I are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. We are special in the eyes of God. Right? It's not that you know, we have to, you know, say, for example, we have to do some great work and then go before God and, and God says, okay, you are special. No. Because of the cross, we are already a special people for our Lord Jesus. Right? Uh, you know, when you uh, look at the world, the world standards is you do something good, you'll get a special reward. You do something better, you know, you get special attention, special reward. But everything is reversed in the kingdom of God. God is saying, you don't have to do anything. All you have to do is believe that you are part of this new covenant. You believe in the cross. And when you do so, we are already a special people. Two, as in the new covenant, we are sons and daughters, kings and priests. Right Now, we've emphasized before that the reason for the blood covenant in the Old, Old Testament also, was for relationship. Now, in the New Covenant, the Lord Jesus restored, he redeemed that relationship. He reconciled us with God, right? Uh, what does it mean to reconcile? We were away from God. He brought us closer to God. So the reason a blood covenant was established for, is for a relationship. Now, before in the old covenant, we were not sons and daughters. When you look at it in the literal terms, because God and we were man as sinners. But now after the cross, God says, you are my sons and daughters. You are, going to, you are kings and priests. Right? And so, as sons and daughters, how much more important it is that we walk in that authority, right? Picture a, a, a king, right? Uh, and this king has a prince. Now, the prince is not going to act like, you know, somebody who's, you know, just walking around in the streets. He's going to act very dignified. He's going to act in a way that, and that he knows, okay, I am going to be the next king of this nation. So I need to portray myself with dignity, with honor, 
and I need to, uh, you know, rule this nation in the right way. And so uh, there's this authority, there's this uh, responsibility also. So just because God has, uh, you know, made us sons and daughters doesn't mean we don't have responsibilities. There are responsibilities. As God has invested, he's given us an inheritance. We are to use that uh, and walk wisely, right? Uh, Peter again writes uh, in his letter and he says, walk circumspectly, walk with good understanding, know what you are doing, understand uh, who you are, be aware of your surroundings. Three, as people in the new covenant, we are living differently. If you read Ephesians chapter four, uh, you know, uh, Paul is writing to the Ephesus church in Ephesus, and he talks about, uh, you know, how what it is to live in Christ. That we walk in unity. He talks about the uh, fivefold ministry of the church, and as believers, we live differently. Now, we may ask this question: How, how you know, how how is it to live differently? I go to work in the morning. I come back in the evening. I have my family. You know, uh, nothing changes. I'm doing what everyone else does. No. How we are living differently is whether we are at home, whether we're in the business, whether in, in the workplace sector, in ministry, wherever we are, we can make a difference uh, in the way we live our lives. People will watch us. People will know, hey, this guy or this girl or this boy, there's something different about him. He's not going to gossip or he's not going to tell a lie. I know that. How is that? We are living with a new covenant. We are mentality. We are living uh, knowing that we are different from people. And what makes that differentiation? The Holy Spirit in us. And we also walk in this new covenant culture right now. Uh, different states, different nations have different cultures of lifestyle, the way they, uh, you know, celebrate uh, Christmas or Easter or the way they, uh, the children are raised up, the way uh, in different, in so many ways, culture is different. Like if, even if you look at our nation, the nation of India itself, um, you know, north, south, east, west, there's so much of differences in the culture. <clears throat> certain places, they, they have breakfast at 5 a.m. And certain places, they have dinner at 7 a.m., 7 p.m. So uh, the, the way of living, the life is very different. Now, we're not talking about that culture, but we're talking about a lifestyle that is in line with the word of God. Remember, the Old Covenant, the scriptures teach us that uh, you know, the book of Hebrews says, uh, in the book of John, sorry, it says that uh, the Old Covenant brought condemnation, brought guilt. But the New Covenant brings grace and truth. The Old Covenant brought hopelessness. There was, there was guilt, condemnation, fear. In the old covenant, the new covenant is full of grace and truth. And so, as believers of the new covenant, you and I are to walk in grace and in truth. What is grace? Grace is unmerited favor, the favor that God places upon us. We walk in the grace of God, we walk in the truth of God's word. That is the culture, right? It's, it's not about, you know, going into church and, you know, covering your hair or removing your shoes or going inside. All of these are practices which are followed by different cultures. But the true new covenant culture is about walking in grace and in truth. So this is a question we can ask ourselves. We say, God, am I walking in the grace of God? Am I walking in truth of the word of God? Am I obeying the word of God? Am I in line with the word of God? Is my life 
uh, reflecting uh, you know the the beauty of Jesus uh, uh, to the people around me then we will know that hey I'm walking in this new covenant finally we live in a new covenant community Paul writes this wonderfully to the Ephesians and he says uh, Ephesians he writes also to the Corinthians and he says uh, is Christ divided uh, uh, this, uh, in, in Ephesians chapter 4 again he says we have one body one body one in spirit one in mind and all the fivefold functions the fivefold ministry of the Holy Spirit it is all to equip the body of Christ to edify the body of Christ and so as new covenant people we must learn to live in community in unity in oneness now I think I believe that you know the time that we are living in uh, unity is something that we do not see because a lot of ministries have different essence have different callings um, of course we do see you know the body of Christ working together different ministries uh, but this needs to grow even more we need to see love and unity spread even more uh, you know the the basis of the new covenant is is not power right we always look at the new covenant and we think oh power of god power of god yes but the foundation the basis of the new covenant is love right god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son Paul writes and he says, if you have all the gifts of the Spirit, you have all the, um, the prophecies, word of knowledge, all these wonderful things that the Holy Spirit gives us, but if we do not have love, it's of no use. So in, in, in a community, if, if there are other ministries, other people, and, we, and if we don't love them, and if we don't love, do the ministry in, uh, out of love, that God has placed in our hearts, then we will fail in, in the aspect of you know being new covenant community. Remember the to the uh, to the Philippians, Paul writes and he says, uh, you know, you're, you, you all have been so wonderful. You all have given me all the gifts. When I was in prison, you have blessed me. You have you have uh, provided me for everything. And then to the Thessalonians, again, Paul writes and he says, uh, I wish to see you. My heart longs to see you. Uh, how is it? Why is all that? Uh, where is all that coming from? Love and unity. And so even in our lives, daily lives, when we walk this walk, understanding that we are part of the new covenant, love and unity must be the basis. Now, there will be times when we don't agree to pe other people's understanding or other people's uh, practices or, or dogmas that they follow, but that should not stop us from, you know, loving them and, and walking in a new covenant. Remember the Lord Jesus, uh, you know, when uh, this is so wonderful, the road to Emmaus, he has died, he has resurrected. The road to Emmaus, two people meet with him and they don't recognize him. But later on, uh, Mary Magdalene come and tell the disciples, these two people come and tell the disciples. And the disciples say, it cannot be. They don't believe them. Right? Uh, and, and, and the story goes on where Later on, Jesus himself appeared to the disciples and he rebuked them for their unbelief. But he chose the same 12, 12, 11, 12 people, 11 people to uh, go out and do the ministry. They were the same 11 people who didn't believe. Why didn't they believe? They saw Jesus on the cross. They saw Jesus was dead. They saw Jesus was put in the tomb. It's been three days. It's not possible. But Jesus did not give up on them. Why? It was the love of God. 
Jesus didn't say, okay, now I have to choose another 11 people because these 11 don't believe I'm alive. No, he didn't say that. He continued to love them. He looked beyond their challenges. He looked beyond their present situations. He knew that they were having a tough time to understand. Uh, they were going through a, a pain in their life. They were going through persecution as well. There was fear. There was pain. There was sorrow. But God, the Lord Jesus, overlooked all of that. And he continued to use these 11 disciples who went about turning the world upside down. And we live in a new covenant community. We will look beyond people's failures. We will look beyond people's struggles. Look at who they are. In, uh, you know, look at who they are who, uh, uh, in the new covenant, that they are children of God. They are kings and priests. They are a royal priesthood, a holy generation, right? So uh, we, we complete that on chapter uh, nine. Any questions, any thoughts anyone has? Uh, uh, and then if not, we can move to chapter 10 and learn what is Jesus doing as our high priest and our mediator? Any questions? Are we living the new covenant life? Are we living that culture? These are questions. Uh, it's good to ask ourselves, right? The more we ask ourselves questions, the more we can learn uh, and the more we feel, okay, God, I need to you know, step up this area of my life. I need to, you know, uh, grow in this area. I need to mature in this area. The Holy Spirit will teach us uh, how to do that. Um, yes, any thoughts, any questions? Should we move on? Okay, no questions? All right, let's go to chapter 10. Chapter 10, we look at high priest and mediator. Now, in the Old Covenant, uh, okay, I'm going to ask some of a question, right? It's awfully quiet. Uh, what does a high priest do in the Old Covenant? Maybe two or three of us, come on. Uh, what does the high priest, what is the role of the high priest in the Old Covenant? High priests uh, stand between people and God and they offer the sacrifices especially on the great atonement day he enters the holy of holies and takes the blood which represents the sin uh, of the entire people and the, uh, the people of Israel uh, he sprinkles it on the holy of holies and, um, and stands in between God and people Okay, yeah, that's wonderful. Thank you, John. Anyone else? What else does the high priest do? Now, we looked at the Old Testament. Uh, what does the high priest do? Uh, like, so John said, the day of atonement, he goes, he takes the blood to represent uh, the nation of Israel. So what, what other thing does the high priest do? Anyone else? So offering sacrifices in. Uh, yeah, Robert, uh, Sid, uh, you're muted now. Uh, you said offering sacrifices. Yes, Master. Okay. Okay. Yes. He helps in uh, the daily offerings of sacrifices as well. What else does he do? He's uh, something really important. Uh, what else does the high priest do? So high priest is the only one who can go to the most holy place. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you, Sid. Anything else? Yeah, so if you look at, uh, you know, God told Moses, you know, Aaron was made the high priest. Uh, what there, there are certain things that he, uh, you know, he does as, we know that, you know, it's more of religious uh, uh, aspects that the high priest looks at. Something very important he does. Uh, I'm just looking for that word. Okay, uh, we'll go into this chapter so we can, uh, you know, get a better idea as well. So basically, the high priest is our mediator, right? Uh, that's that's the word uh, 
uh, I was looking for, uh, he's a mediator, right? He's, he talks to God on behalf of us. He represents God on behalf of us. He stands between God and man. So look at chapter 10. What does Jesus do as our high priest and our mediator? Right? What does the resurrection and exaltation of Christ mean to us as believers? Jesus died. He rose again. Now he's, he's not sitting in heaven relaxing. But what is he doing? So we will look at that from this chapter. First one, Jesus Christ was the firstborn from the dead. Let's read Colossians chapter 1 and verse 18. Go ahead. Colossians 1.18. Colossians 1 18, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, things he may have the preeminence. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, brother. So that's, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. Now, Jesus Christ. Was, was the one who came into this world, firstborn from the dead, meaning that from among sin, right? Born without sin, born into this world and became the head of the body, which is the church. And in him that he may have, and in all things that he may have preeminence. Right? So the Lord Jesus represents us. Just because Jesus rose up from the dead, you and I can, you know, you, you and I have this understanding that, hey, this physical body is not the end. Right? This is just something that, you know, this, our, our soul, our spirit is inside. But our spirit is who we really are. And so we understand that this body will fade away. And since Jesus Christ, he overcame death on the cross. He overcame, he died and he resurrected. He overcame death. You and I, as his children, can overcome death. He has authority over hell and death. Revelations 1.18. Let's read that. Revelations chapter 1 and verse 18. Revelations chapter 1 verse 18. I am he who lives and was dead and behold I am alive forevermore. Amen. 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 And I have the keys of Hades and of death. Thank you, John. Now, this is the Lord Jesus himself saying this. this John is looking at uh, the exalted, the glorified Jesus. He looks at Jesus and he falls at Jesus' feet. And he says, I am he who was dead, but now I am alive forevermore. And I hold the keys of death and hell. The word keys means authority. I, I have the authority over death and hell. So the Lord Jesus in the new covenant as a high priest, as a mediator has destroyed the works of the devil, right? He, sin came into this world. Sin, the effect of sin is death. What did the Lord Jesus do? He reversed it. He said, I'll come into this world. I live this perfect life and I will die, but death will not keep me down. I will overcome death as well. So he's emphatically, he's declaring to John and he's saying, John, I was dead, but now I'm alive. And I will be alive forevermore. I have the keys of death and hell. Satan has been destroyed. Right? You and I have got a mediator who is in authority over death and hell. The Lord Jesus has given us the authority. He says, I'm giving you authority to trample over snakes and scorpions. Right? So 
as new as new testament believers we are to walk in that authority we are to walk in that anointing right uh you know i remember this one time uh we were in small i think a city in uh, andhra pradesh and you know i didn't know much of the word it's probably about 23 years old uh i didn't know much of the word but all i knew is jesus is victorious right and i knew that the lord can do anything in a person's life so we were in a uh, town and you now we were just doing these small evangelistic meetings with about you know 50 60 people from the towns and villages they would come uh, just just small uh, you know very uh, uh, farmers and uh, carpenters tailors very low income people very uh, earnestly they love the lord uh you know they come every day every sunday to church for fasting prayers and all of that so we went there to this it's a town i would say it's a village but it was a small town and uh uh we started uh, you know we had the whole like a three day meeting and so we were you know just teaching some basic stuff about you know what the lord jesus did about the cross about Uh, you know uh, the authority that god has given us and then we would spend time praying for the people there was this one time this you know this lady just began to manifest and she came straight to my face and she said oh, do you know who i am and all of that uh, at initially i was uh, i was really scared i was really afraid i said god what is this you know all of a sudden this moment came and uh, I was really scared and I was about to just take the mic and keep it aside and uh, uh probably walk off the stage uh, but at that moment I remember saying God fill me with your holy spirit I need your holy spirit now now no matter what muscles or no matter how many times we go to the gym all of that is not going to matter when you see things like this right whether we are uh, you know fitness whether we are fit in our body now all that is important but the enemy the devil is not afraid of uh, us whether we are fit or whether we are unfit whether we are you know going to the gym and all of those things no 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 uh, and this woman came and i said god give me your holy empower me with your holy spirit and so at that moment some kind of a boldness came into me and i pictured this right Jesus uh, it was just a picture right it was a picture that came into my mind Jesus was giving me a key right uh, it was just like a picture giving me a key and i took that key and i realized that in the bible all through the bible the word keys refers to authority and it was like Jesus is giving me the authority so all of a sudden that woman who was highly possessed two things happened first thing is i was not afraid right i knew that he is already defeated i was not afraid at all and two uh there was this feeling of love and sadness for the person who is going through this you know sometimes we get very upset with the person who's possessed we uh but there was a feeling for the person you know th- that's not what he this woman has to go through uh, you know being possessed by this woman and i just remember saying i just put my hand on this woman i said in the name of jesus i command you to come out of this body right there right i didn't i didn't scream and shout and you know slap the woman or or you know just cause a whole uh, ruckus there nothing just in the name of jesus i command you to get out of her body that moment the spirit that was tormenting her for about 8 years that boom in an instant it just left her right uh and she was free right now i was only about 23 years old and i when i saw that i was surprised i know about no bible college no uh, nothing i i didn't know revelations and all of those things but as new testament believers as believers when we know that the lord jesus has given us authority over hell and death he has he has he has destroyed the enemy the way we walk will change we will walk in authority
we will walk in power. Now, I'm not saying that uh, later on, many other instances, I did feel fear again, right? Because some, some of those instances are very scary, but the Lord has overcome. Remember, the enemy comes but to bring fear, right? He brings all these you know, thoughts of fear. He comes to destroy our faith. And so we must walk in this authority. Remember that all authority belongs to Jesus. Right? And there are three verses there. Let's read Hebrews 2 and 9, like this verse. Hebrews 2 and 9. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 9. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 9. But we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. Yes. Thank you, John. So, we see here in Hebrews 2.9 that he was made lower than angels just so that he could taste death. But now, all authority, both on heaven and on earth, belongs to the Lord Jesus. Who is in authority over hell? The Lord Jesus is. Right? There is there is no demon that can, you know, come and just, you know, have a casual conversation with Jesus. No, no, no. There's power, there's glory, there's authority. You know, we sing that song, in the name of Jesus, demons will have to flee. Right? It's it's not just some song that we sing. It is truth. In the name of Jesus, demons will don't will don't just sit around, they flee. They run away. The word flee is to, you know, not just walk away. It's to run away the opposite direction. All authority has big belongs to him. Now our high priest, Jesus, our mediator, all authority belongs to Jesus. Every believer lives with the hope of resurrection. Now we must understand that heaven is real. Hell is real. There is eternity that we all must face. You know, uh, when we look at what's happening around us, uh, there are different thoughts of schools which say that, you know, uh, there is no hell. This is only hell. Or, you know, there is no uh, heaven. There is there is no eternity. You know, once we die, uh, we become something else or uh, or we just go into the grave. And it's the end. It's not the end. The Bible teaches us in First Corinthians, uh, he writes and he says, there is a hope of resurrection. Right? Paul writes to the Thessalonians, why? Because people came into the church and said, uh, you know, what if the resurrection has already happened? Now they were fearful. And then Paul begins to explain to them, saying, don't you know that in a twinkling of an eye, we will be changed, we will meet him in the clouds. And so each one of us as believers we live with the hope of resurrection. No demon or no work of the enemy can stop us from being resurrected in Christ. What can the enemy do? Now we must understand that the enemy can bring death. There will be physical death, right? But the hope that you and I have is that we will resurrect in Christ Jesus. The moment we are in Christ, the day that we die, at that moment we will be resurrected in Christ and we will stand with him. We will see him. The Bible says we will see him face to face. What a hope that is. right? And so we need to live with that hope. Now, it does not mean that we live in fear, oh, I don't want to die, I don't want to die. No. It's, it's something that we have to face. But we have this assurance. We will live with him. We will see him face to face. There will be eternity with the Lord Jesus Christ. Every believer has the right to use the name that is above every other name, the name of Jesus. Jesus has given us the authority. Now, after Jesus died, he resurrected, he went up to heaven. He says, he gave the great commission to the disciples. He said, go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. 
So Jesus has given us the authority to use the name, right? Uh, you know, for example, uh, you know, example, you can't get into a school, right? Uh, the parents are not allowed, example, right? Say, for example, the parents are not allowed in school during the class hours, right? Uh, uh, now, if I say, if I tell the security guard at the gate that principal, the, the name of the principal, uh, this principal, the name, she told me to come and meet me at 12 o'clock. What is going to happen? He's going to say, okay, you have used the name, so you're allowed to go inside, right? So Jesus is saying, no, I've not just finished the work, but I'm, it's not like I finished the work and I'm done it and I've gone and sat in heaven. No, Jesus is saying, I'm giving you the authority. I'm giving you the authority. You use the name, the name of Jesus. And that's what happened in the book of Acts. Acts 3, Peter heals the lame man. And all through the book of Acts, we see that healings happen in the name of Jesus. That same name is still powerful today. The same name is still effective today. And this is proof of his resurrection. You can't say, if Jesus had died and he has not resurrected, I can't pray in the name of Jesus. It's not going to have any effect. But since Jesus has overcome that, resurrected to heaven, when we use the name of Jesus, it is still effective. And God has given us this commission to go and make known his name. Every believer has his resurrection power at work in them. Right. So let's read Ephesians chapter 1, verse 19 and 20. Ephesians 1, 19 and 20. Ephesians 1, 19 and 20. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power? which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places. Amen. Thank you, Zeli. So we see a God exerted his power to resurrect the Lord Jesus Christ and seated him in heavenly places. God is still willing to exert the same resurrection power in our lives. Remember, we looked at the Lord's table. And uh, we looked at the covenant. The sign of the new covenant was the Lord's table. And we saw that how when we partake in the bread, when we partake in the juice uh, or, or the wine, and we, and we say this is the body, this is the blood, we are partaking in the resurrection power. We are remembering his death, but we are also partaking in the resurrection power. Right? So it's not only grieving. Good Friday is not only about grieving. It is about uh, remembering what he did, but it's also about a victory. When the Lord Jesus said it's finished, it was victory. But we remember the pain, the suffering, the agony that he went through for us. And so the Lord Jesus is willing. Every believer has this resurrection power at work in them. Now, here's the thing. I'll just use this example. Now, if I, for example, I, I, I give you the authority or I give you a, the, the keys to the church, like when I'm, I'm talking about the physical church location, right? What am I doing? I'm giving authority, right? Now, if I give it to one person and I say, okay, make sure that after two months from now, when I'm back, everything is all right. You know, every Sunday services go on well. So I gave this person the key. And I come back after two months and I see that you know the chairs are broken, the tables are not in place, the place is a mess, it's fully dirty, the cables are not working, the mics are not working, the guitars are broken. What am I going to think? I'm going to think that this person has not used the authority that I've given him in the right way. Or either he has misused it or he has not bothered about it. Right? He has just left it as it is. 
and the whole place is still smelling. He has not cleaned it. He is not. So what am I trying to get at? Every believer, the Lord has, God has given us his resurrection power in us. Now it's up to us to use it in our lives, in our daily situations. Right? So for example, uh, you know, we see a, a challenge ahead of us. How do we you know, react to that challenge? How do we uh, respond to it? What is the first thing that comes to our mind? Right? Now, the resurrection power is in us. The power of God is in us. We are to use it. Right? So if I give a key to this person and I say, this is the church key. Imagine he goes there, he stands outside and he says he has the key in his hand, but he doesn't open the, the church. It doesn't make sense. And they say, I've given you the authority, but you're not using it. Open it. Use the key. Open the, ch open the church and go inside. He had the authority, but he didn't use it. So the same way, the Lord Jesus has given us authority. It is up to us to use it. And now, more than the old covenant, the Lord Jesus has given us so much more in the new covenant. Picture this, Moses and uh, you know, David and Daniel, they didn't have the scriptures. They couldn't go back and keep reading scriptures. No, no. And now with the new covenant, we have so much more. Right? We have so much more. We can go to the scriptures. We can read. We can ask the Holy Spirit for revelation. We can ask the Holy Spirit to teach us when we don't understand. You know, the book of John says, if you lack wisdom, sorry, the book of James says, uh, if you lack wisdom, ask him. He will give you uh, uh, abundantly. And so it's very important uh, that we use the resurrection power that God has placed in us. Right, uh, So we'll get into what the scripture reveals about Jesus and what is Jesus doing on our behalf, uh, standing at the Father's right hand. Right, So we'll take a break. We'll come back at 11. We'll begin with what Jesus is doing on our behalf as a mediator in heaven. Right? Uh, let's take a break. We'll come back at uh, 11 o'clock here. Yeah.